Um, so let's let's get this started, yeah? yeah. Um, I just wanna say hi, good evening. My name is Kara Wilson Cook. I am the events coordinator for the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in Acton, Massachusetts. Hey. Um, welcome to what I, I'm calling, I'm just fondly calling it, um, poetry night in the silver unicorn zoom room because why not and because that seems fun so I brought I hope you brought your tea or something more interesting <laughs> and that you are here for it. yes exactly Kirk yes yeah. yes yes um, and I, I just it. hope that you are uh, here and just you're ready for some just soothing vibes in what has otherwise been a pretty insane world. Um, so thank you for coming. Oh, you should know that books are available at the Silver Unicorn if you are local or silverunicorn.com. If you are not, we do ship all over the place. So um, do please order and um, don't forget to uh, support your local independent bookstore no matter where you are. Um, and with that, I am going to get us started by introducing um, our main guest, who is Kirk. Westfall, who is, it is Westfall. I did pronounce that right, didn't I? I should have asked before we got started. Right. Okay, good. Very good. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Kirk Westfall is a scientist by day and dabbles in the arts by night. His job takes him around the United States to plan for clean and plentiful water. In the evenings, he writes poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and music in easy keys. I don't know if I know what that means. I'm going to ask during the Q&A <laughs> section. Um, he's the author of two previous books, his first poetry collections, Bodies of Wood and Water, which came out in 2018, and a nonfiction collection of great moments in sports that happen to everyday people, no ordinary game. But we are here to celebrate the launch, well, not the launch, it's been launched, but the, the um, release of his brand new collection, Arts and Sciences, which I believe is about water, yes? Some of it is, yeah, some of it. Some of it is about water. So we're looking forward to um, his readings. And then, you know what, with that, I'm going to stop rambling. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here this evening. I know I need some poetry tonight. I hope that all of y'all do, too. Um, this is going to be really, really lovely. And thank you, Kirk, for, um, for approaching us for this and helping me put it together. And I hope that you have a wonderful uh, set of readings. Well, thanks, Kira, and thanks to you and Paul and Silver Unicorn for sponsoring this and helping us get this set up. This is a really, really fun reunion for, for some of us. Uh, we met almost 10 years ago, uh, maybe it was almost, maybe, maybe longer than that, at a poetry contest, uh, a plein air poetry contest uh, at Fruitlands uh, Museum, which is where the Alcotts uh, lived and worked uh, for a while. And uh, George and Georgia and I met there and Susan was one of the organizers of that poetry contest. And from that, uh, we started a poetry group uh, that met uh, somewhat regularly for a while. And we've just all stayed in touch and have been friends and have done readings together. And I'm just absolutely delighted to have this group of people here uh, tonight. Um, I'll introduce people before they read. Uh, and uh, you, know, get, you can get to know them a little bit, but you'll really get to know them uh, by how they read and what they read. Uh, I really admire these poets because they're so different. Uh, there's something very peculiar about their style and tone and voice uh, that <laughs> George is laughing at. <laughs> you know who I'm talking in a, about. In a good way. <laughs> in, in, a very, in a very good way. Um, Susan writes about nature in, in ways that I've never seen. Uh, George has a, a view of the world that, that needs to be publicized. And Georgia uh, has a wonderful way of spinning uh, amazing ends to her poems uh, that I really admire and try to emulate as best I can. So without uh, any further uh, banter here, um, I'll introduce George first, uh, who'll be our first reader. I need to read you his bio just because he, this, I don't know, George, I don't know what poems you're going to read tonight, but this might be as good as any of your poems. This, I mean, they're great poems. This is really a great bio. Uh, George Clark's poems are a tapenade of loss and longing spread on a hope cracker, served with a riesling of the Rust Belt. <laughs> I love that. His work has been published in Shot Glass Journal, West Texas Literary Review, and Lines in the Landscape, a multi author chapbook. That was the one that originated from the uh, Fruitlands contest where we met. He's a former columnist for Environment Magazine, and he is the author of a one act farce set in academia called Lordy Parkinson Gets Hit by a Bus. George is pursuing a master's degree in drama at Harvard Extension, and he played a janitor in the recent Apple TV Plus limited series, Defending Jacob. 
In his spare time, George is a college librarian. George, take it away. Have some fun. Thanks, Kirk. In January, stars turn with hangover, heartburn. Somehow February's less festive, less merry. March starts with melting and bourbon for belting. And then April's blossoming cheers prisoners at Ossining. May has its kindnesses, forgetful and mindlessness. June has its strawberries, racketeering, robberies. July has its melons and white collar felons. August for sweating, dog racing, and bedding. September, hay fevers, stilettos, and cleavers. October comes creeping with Tom and leaf peeping. November's drynesses may be hell on our sinuses, but December's graynesses only stiffen our anuses. <laughs> so good evening, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, a little neighborhood called Stowe, Massachusetts, and hello to friends and family who may be turning in, tuning in. Well, you might be turning in if I don't do too well tonight. So hopefully you're tuning in. Um, we're here to celebrate um, Kirk Westfall's new book, uh, Arts and Sciences, um, as well as being literarily uh, brilliant. Uh, these poems are just touching. So I hope that you will go to Silver Unicorn's website and get yourself a copy. One other th thing, though, is that um, Kirk is also a prose writer. Um, this is his book, uh, No Ordinary Game, Miraculous Moments in Backyards and Sandlots. Um, a really good read about why sports is important to all of us. Um, you may think, oh, sports is not my thing. Well, I'm about as macho as a tuna casserole. Um, and I really like this book. It had me tearing up um, in a good way, um, in the, even the, in the introduction. So check that again. It's called No Ordinary Game. So that first poem that I read was called uh, Book of Months with a nod to Dorothy Parker. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be reading um, three uh, short poems and one, one long poem from my uh, poetry manuscript called uh, Next Morning with Pickles. Um, and then I'll be uh, following up with a um, fairly recent poem that hopefully will resonate with what's going on with everyone tonight. So uh, my um, fun beverage of choice is a highly toxic uh, uh, diet cola. So I'm just going to wet my whistle here for a second. And we'll start off with this poem, which is um, called Not From Here Originally, and it's dedicated to all of us who uh, came to New England or to wherever we are from some other place. I left my coat on the newspaper box. I see it from inside the train. My fellow rut dwellers updating their stocks. My sweater unravels again. A white trash ambassador getting the shakes in a land of perpetual gray. My color is pumpkin emblazoned on snakes. I can't think what quite I should say. If Concord and Weston are bedrooms of spite, what township is more like my speed? No craft beer and speeches with artisan ice, Budweiser is more what I need. Their menu has grass fed and free range and shoots. I meant to change out of these clunky ass boots. Thank you. So um, a shout out uh, because the next one's a love poem to the loves in my life, Elizabeth, my wife, and 
Will and Sophie, who may be uh, watching from the family room as they eat their dinner. So hi. This one is called um, Raggedy Woman. I've had enough of polish. Give me a raggedy woman to sit with on a log by the fire and talk with friends without it being ironic because the smoke penetrates even the metal washer worn as pendant, all circles and not facets, like you might see in the pictures. Boots slightly melted on the edges, wisp of dog hair on the shirt collar, an, unapology strong, an, up, an unapologetically strong bicep. She has life insurance because it's practical headquartered in Lansing, not New York, appreciates the slow growth of moss because the appreciation is in the noticing. What does a raggedy woman do? Loves fiercely, does justice already, hums tenderly. Let's come together without pretense, make a bedspread out of yellow leaves, slightly damp and moldy. It's the cinched up belt loop, Cajun fries, stigmata, not bracelets, and also engine repair, keeping the railroad running after the corporation has demolished the station. Rung after rung of going on about it and not necessarily climbing the telephone pole carries fiber optics, yes, but also old glass insulators, everlasting. So the next poem I wrote um, is sort of an acknowledgement of this endless war that we've been in for the last couple of decades. But I found that it begins to apply to some of the feelings that we have these days. Um, strong people running into things that question their solidity. It's called the ba Battalion Surgeon's Post-Operative Pain. Her leg beneath the table, a bald iron ironic friend she never planned to find herself on the receiving end. A simple application to one exclusive club, blood pooled inside her plastic clogs from shrapnel through her scrubs. She's finished with her family and faking with her church. She smells the incense, sterile drapes, old fire back at work. She banters with a gas man and steadies up the nurse. You'd hardly know the phantom pain is only getting worse. On Sunday, China dropping, the mask beneath her eyes. You'd hardly know what's missing. She says she has just fine. Right, on a more cheery note, um, this poem is about uh, what happens at the restaurant McDonald's after the morning rush happens when all the local folks come and use it as their front porch. Um, there's the sound of people talking and the TV on the news and also people ordering and what's going on in my head. It's called McDonald's at 10 a.m. or 4.30 in the afternoon. And this is the long one that I told you about. Old people talking loud. Had a cat, her name was Lilith. Black and white she was. Screaming beauties on the business channel. Those overdraft fees are outrageous. The plush incision of a sausage biscuit. P 
peonies exploding on the curbside garden feature. I guess her leg is swelling up. It takes a lot out of you. For here, please. Wrinkled skin, they don't listen to the decades old wisdom of dermatologists. Chocolate pudding, vanilla pudding, tapioca, sugar free, all sugar free. Pudding oil, jello, says she. Rhubarb pie, says he. Baked potato, sweet potato. What is that? Once in a blue moon? Old corn, sweet corn. I had zucchini last night. Baked potato, sour cream. We'll probably have chicken again. I cut them down the middle. The package is too big. Crime and justice correspondent. Oh yeah, $2 more than the regular. The party with a big buffet, then you have a variety. What kind of fisherman are you? You're canceled. 56% say acceptable. My tenant in Concord spent her own money on her own stove, own refrigerator, burgundy wallpaper, protesters clash in Turkey. Cranberry sauce in a can, I ate every bit of it. She loves chicken, you should have seen it. Apple unveils updates. Yesterday in CVS, she was having a hard time. I said, tell me about it. Talking heads. I don't have a cold, I don't get colds. Reminds me of my daughter and I didn't eat no sauce or anything. I had a sandwich, a sandwich. Huge data farm, fisherman's friend. Fisherman's friend. Maybe. Yeah. No wonder. You know how you kill them? Heat. Heat. They're very temperature sensitive. Whatever you do is fine by me. I'm only telling you fact, not fiction. He's a high school dropout and he's making that kind of money? Good for him. Set up in 1978, data farm. Well, Laura, that's exactly the question. Check the garage door. Secrets, and what do you think the guy is sitting on? A hundred thousand dollars. Another file on you back in the 60s, the secret court. An indoor pool and an outdoor pool and a built-in pool. Germany did it. They have a very subtle way. Good luck with it. But your hair is still perfect. Your hair is still your hair. Chicken biscuit. Beauty shouting on TV. Chicken biscuit. Chicken biscuit. Had a cat, her name was Lilith. Tina loves you guys. Connie, beauty's on TV, Lilith, Laura, Tina, Biscuit. <laughs> Thanks for listening, you all. Um, I'm going to close with uh, another poem that's not from my book. It's actually a, a relatively um, recent poem that's called um, In Hard Times. And as you might expect, it's about um, what's going on these days. My office <coughs> spare room needs a little tidy up. Yes, I still need that LP of Joan Baez sings the hits of Slim Whitman. My souvenir conference mug, Sess Inc. 2018, overfloweth with pens. Why is mold a recurring theme in my work? Does that mean I need yet another shrink? 
all the stuff that I like and my lovely spouse can't stand, stacked higher than would be ideal, my hanging green sheet doesn't hide at all when I turn on my cool background. Me as sportscaster instead of Gerald Ford playing football back in the old days. Raw. A vague sense of unease tells me that a nap is more important than my distance job or else it means I have asymptomatic corona. Let's just let that sit there. Nobody wants to Zoom with me because all my pens are a sign of weakness in the digital age. And because I should be embarrassed, I haven't purged my books yet. And my overarching question, my mission statement, my cheese that nobody better move is what rhymes with webinar? All right, thanks everybody. I'm gonna kick it back to Kirk. Um, thanks for coming out and uh, check out the Silver, Silver Unicorn website. Take care. George, that was awesome, thank you. Um, if you're ever feeling lonely, I'll Zoom with you anytime. And if we can't do that, <laughs> Because I struggle with it too. We'll just go down to McDonald's and we'll hang out there. Chat with everybody, right? Sounds good. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, George. Um, <clears throat> next friend uh, tonight to read is George Assassin. Uh, George is a, a good friend uh, who we met again at this uh, poetry contest uh, at Fruitlands in Massachusetts. Uh, she mentioned earlier uh, as the room was filling up that. She has long practiced uh, psychotherapy and has explained to me that she infuses art into, into the way that she has helped a lot of people over the years. Uh, she's a wonderful poet, a wonderful friend, and Georgia, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Kirk. I'm looking forward to, new, to your new book. And George, that was wonderful. It's just fantastic to hear your poems again. Thanks, Georgia. I'm going to start with one that also has a cat in it, like your, uh, your, your McDonald's cat. It's called Lady Cat Can't Sue. That mangy cat with the ear infected and the fur matted beyond color recognition found a safe place to give birth, controlled by the species imperatives. In the shed under the deck, out of the rain, the weather they call dog weather in France. She found half a bale of straw, not yet moldy, and made her soft bed. Here, sides and rakes and shears made a screen no dog could penetrate. Which of those, but which of those stray alley cats penetrated her? Even if she knew, a stray cat can't sue for child support. And after that segue from McDonald's to something light, we get a little more serious. This is called egg. It has a haiku embedded in it. Pick up this egg. It practically writes its own haiku. Take with you my soft hen warmth, warmer than your hand, <clears throat> this chilly morning. And another very short poem. This is called Immigrating. Written a little while ago, <clears throat> just around the time that uh, Trump was saying close the borders and uh, they're coming in a caravan and uh, all of the hate speech against immigrants. It's called Immigrating. Behind me, all that I know. In my pocket, a phrase book. Beneath clouds, home disappears. The next, I think it's two poems, not three, uh, were written here in Harvard at Fruitlands, the experiment that Bronson 
Halcott, the transcendentalist, uh, tried out for one winter. Uh, he was hoping to live off the land and discuss philosophy, transcendentalism, and God in the evenings. And uh, he had a family with four children, one of whom was Louisa May Alcott. And they were all going to live off the land in this little house uh, here in Harvard. He didn't do much of the farm work, apparently, and they did not last the winter. Uh, in the middle of the winter, they were about to starve, and Mrs. Alcott said, I'm taking the children. If you want to stay here and starve, you can. Um, one problem they had was his feelings about what you should grow and keep for winter. People kept things in root cellars, and they dried fruit, things like that, um, hung up hams. But, but <laughs> my husband is echoing me with his phone. Uh, but Bronson Alcott did not believe that we should eat root vegetables because they didn't grow directly in the light of God. So what happened? The Alcott's year. We know now how much we need the trees. They clean our air. They let us breathe. Bronson knew. He knew he needed trees and grain and fruit and sunlight. The writings of the sages, these he knew. He didn't know he needed those potatoes too. And the problem with this Zoom thing is I can't hear you laughing. So I hope you're laughing. Husband's coming back, he's gonna laugh. Yeah. I'm laughing, Georgia. Oh, good. <laughs> um, this is called Rebecca's Garden, also written over at Fruitlands where there is a cellar hole. That's all that is left of Rebecca's house, a small house next to the Willard family house, uh, which she lived in with her husband, Phineas, Phineas Jr. Uh, around 1830. Stones in the ground. This was her workroom where she spun and wove and sewed and put up food for winter. Here was her garden where she grew what they would need. She is picking blackberries. The fruit, cool and dark and sweet, weighs in her hand. She puts a handful to her mouth. In her mind, a voice says, don't, we need them for winter. It is her husband's voice, Phineas. She eats them anyway. Phineas is watching from the barn. He approaches her from behind. She hears him. He will be angry. She stops. He turns her around, kisses the juice from her chin. Phineas, smelling of sweat and hay. No more work that day. This one's, now we zoom, we zoom from Fruitlands to the suburbs. Summer night. Moon, warm, summer night. It's magic is that it is different and yet the same. The same as all the other summer nights you have lived. The same as the night a lover rolled you in the grass. The same as the night you kissed a boy for the first time among the heavy scent of roses in the garden at the side of the house. The same garden where one summer night you planted your farm of buds and berries while your parents talked on the patio, ice clinking between the sentences. You dug with a spoon, but they didn't yell at you because it was a summer night and nobody cared if a child dug with a spoon or the bank account was low or their teenage son was out all night in the car with the girl under the big moon. This one is called Ice Cycle. And a couple of you who are reading tonight really liked it, so I thought it's old, but I'm putting it in here. Ice Cycle. Common cattails, spires of dark velvet, ordinary pond water 
silkens in the soft light, reflecting the gray pelt of sky. Fleece gilded for one last second of sun, low in the southwest. November silence, soon to be scoured by Arctic wind, white spine of the earth exposed, white ghosts of birch beside the brooding spruce, ice where silk lay. Spires coated in frost until the grand growing sun plays the ice, strange sounds arising as the cracks and fissures grow, freeing the water. Silk again. In the cool morning, bird calls. Snow only in the hollows. Bluebirds' bright backs flash in spring sun. Evening comes later now. Frogs call, birds call, weaving the air with sound. Streams, springs, spores let loose on the spongy carpet. Everything breathes, breeds, water moves again. Another autumn poem called Pumpkin Flower. This is one I wrote at Old Frog Pond Farm, which you, I think, just heard about from someone else. Look at the shape of this thing. It studied for millions of years to learn that the shape of a trumpet, before there was a trumpet, was the perfect way to attract a bird when all the insects were busy elsewhere. It had learned that birds could bring pollen to the beloved, so she could take it in and grow a great glowing fruit shaped like the autumn moon that would light up the night. And this bird poem also takes place in the autumn. It's called Grounded, Not Singing. I thought it was an eastern towhee scratching at the ground, but it was too late in the year for that when the months are numbered in double digits. And we hadn't heard the sweetly loud towhee for many weeks. No, it was the first of the autumn juncos, returned from wherever they go in summer, like Boston Brahmins boating up to Maine. In his gray suit and white breast, like a pressed shirt straight from the cleaners, the junko went about his business, methodically picking up seeds and reestablishing his territory, I guess for the serious time of year. And this last one is also a poem from New England history. Um, probably many of you know that when uh, the capitalists established the cotton mills in Lowell and Lawrence and southern New Hampshire. They often hired young girls from the farms uh, to do the work that was monotonous and uh, tedious and required careful little fingers. Some of the girls were quite young, like 13, 14. Um, and one reason those girls were available was that life on the farm was hard, the farms were poor, and often the parents needed them to send money home. Some of them found that working 10 hours a day was better than working dawn to dusk because they had Sundays and an evening to themselves, and they were away from home. So this one is called Selfless. It's about Martha, possibly one of those girls. Here lived Martha, the fourth of 10, working the family farm. While father and the boys bring in the hay, she and mother pick the fruit. In between diapering babies, boiling the linen, remaking old quilts, they can the fruit and beans and beets in the steaming kitchen. They have enough for winter, most years. Now it is hot August, scent of hay and apples, Rhythms of father and Henry scything a field. She and mother pick the fat berries at the end of the lane where the old horse is out to pasture. Can they afford to keep him now that his time of work is ended? And later, years from now, 
Will Henry be able to keep father and mother and her if she does not marry? Must she marry? Tonight, when the children wait in the pond and Robin sing off key, she will ask father, though mother must not know. Should I go to the mills, send money home so you can keep the horse, keep the farm? Selfless, she will sound, but what she'll be, that mother never was, is what the crickets sing at night. Free, 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 free. Thank you. Georgia, thank you. That was wonderful. I'll reiterate what I said earlier. One of the things I have always loved about your poetry is your turn of phrase at the very end of a poem. Uh, your poem, uh, Rebecca's Garden, has been one of my favorites for a long time because of that last line. No more work today. I love that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Georgia. I'm glad you liked it. Let me introduce uh, our next reader, Susan Edwards Richmond. Susan and I have done a number of readings together, and Susan, it's always a pleasure to, to join you in a, in a venue like this. She is the author of five collections of nature based poetry for adults and the Parents' Choice Silver Award winning picture book Bird Count. She organizes an annual plein air poetry walk at Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio in Harvard, Massachusetts, and teaches at Drumlin Farm Community Preschool in Lincoln. So, Susan. Thank you so much, Kirk. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to thank Kirk and Kira for organizing this wonderful evening tonight. On, and congratulations to you, Kirk, on your, your new book, Arts and Sciences. I can't wait to, weed, can't wait to read it. Um, it's a re real pleasure to read with you all again. Those were wonderful poems, Georgia, and it's great to hear your voice after so many years, George. Um, I got a real kick out of, out of your poems as well. Um, I also realized you said you were from Stowe, and I'm in Stowe too, um, as of the last couple of years. And I'm going to actually start by reading a sequence of poems um, that's based on uh, some sculptures done by uh, my friend and a very talented artist, Linda Hoffman, that are installed, permanently installed in Leggett Woodland, which is uh, one of the conservation areas in Stowe. So I'm going to do something that's a little tricky for me, but hopefully it will go smoothly. And that is share my screen so that you can look at the sculptures as I read the poems. Um, the series is called Story Hour. Leggett Woodland, Five Sculptures on First Tales Path by Linda Hoffman. And this first one is Acrobats. How do you define joy? Is it the arc of riding another's back where she leans over a sturdy platform from which he launches, arms raised? Two figures, but you can't imagine them unjoined, one depending on the other's balance, ballast, anchor, wings, Caps upward, forward, bronze feet dig into moss, then solid rock, boulders sunk into deeper ground, the way I curl my toes into carpet or floorboards and feel the same, what I'm built upon, what's part of me, I couldn't abide sundering. The root is a screw in the rock, drilled in epoxy set, permanent, Though that word we can't take lightly, I saw the sculptor fix it in the wood, and who can say it's not her gift to permanence, whatever that comes to mean. These figures are really quite small, just, um, well, that one was probably about eight inches tall, um, maybe a little bit bigger than that one. This one is, is smaller. Um, they're meant to actually invite play from families from children coming and a lot of them have, as you can see, little acorn hats or they're holding acorn caps and encourage children to come and put more acorns on them. So this next poem is called Froggy and it's spoken in the voice of the frog. This is what I bring, not caps for everyone, but for a few. I'm drying out after a soaking rain 
having rescued my prize from the mulch of the wood. You can't see me if you're looking, which is why I've arranged today for all you non-believers who don't know the forest is your home with its infinite rooms and rugs, furniture and drapes. You modeled your living spaces after mine, knowing what you liked best, the shelter of caves, the music of jays calling their names, the sturdiness of rock, but with cushion underfoot. Now I'm pleading with you, come back. You've been away too long. Look at my striped eye, my flaming sides, I and the jewel you once strived to represent when you made from these pillars of trees your most convincing God. Next one is called Handstander. My posture aligns with the forest, but I reverse expectations. If I were taller, would you mistake me for a tree? I have chosen to wear my hats on my hands as well as my head. You can't be too sure of surfaces, manners, the need for protection. Every oak seed takes this oath when it leaves its high wire act to commune with soil or the innards of a squirrel. Doffing it only when settled when certain, or when uncrowned by nature's forces. To affect the loss of trees in this clearing, what if I become one? My legacy, hanging toes to the sky, hands to the earth? All of us must pledge something, make the deep dive. If not, we're as ephemeral as leaves whispering in the wind, whichever way it blows, someday we'll all fall to the ground to become something bigger. Better be ready. And this next one is mother and child. She is the one without a cap. No protection from the rain or the wind. She sits in the lee of stone, moss-backed rock rising in a peak behind her body. The sun touches her head briefly, her right thigh a burnished glow. Her infant stays shade cradled in solid arms and will never leave. And the last one in this sequence is talking with turtle. The slow plot of conversation takes us to the forest floor, our nails scuttling, scratching on leaves. Your feet flail and strive with the certainty of instinct. My human perambulations have no such explanations. It's why we wait in a quiet corner for wisdom to age us into art. The scoots on your shell, always 13, always that uneasy number. Is it true, I'd like to ask you, that we were born on the backs of your ancestors? That the egg did not come first? That our first meals were bloodworm and nymph? and a sharp snap preceded all words. Now, as we lean together in unfettered talk, you are my endearing fairy tale turtle, and I dream of riding you like I ride any story, full on into the hatch of the waves. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And that was fun to be able to read those poems. I haven't done those at a reading because um, except for actually at the opening of the exhibit itself, which was great fun. 
So I'm glad to be able to share them today. And hopefully some people who might not live too far from Stowe can, can go and see the sculptures in person and interact with them. I'm going to close with two poems from my book, Before We Were Birds, um, which is available through Silver Unicorn. And please do check out Silver Unicorn website for all of their books and Kirk's book, particularly for his launch today. Um, so I'm going to read Piping Plover, which probably many of you are familiar with this little rascal uh, bird that that lives and breeds on the shores of New England and in Massachusetts and several places where people are kept off the beaches during, during the breeding season, which I always find it a joy to find them, but some people are a little frustrated that they have to wait for that cycle of these little chicks to, to grow up um, before they can return to the beaches. Piping, pl pl whoops. Piping plover, Solitary ghost, nearly erased by sand, wanders so close to the beachcomber's path, we are told, beware the right of way of all endangered creatures. Spindly legs impress the shore, picking up the light body, scuttling in the halting manner of characters from old cartoons who tiptoe in barrels behind cactus. It wears its own disguise rubbed out at the horizon when concentration wavers, then awakes in each new movement. Marking so clear, the throat ring catches and pulls, the winds collar. Friendship is not a flock of birds rising as a single phrase, but the one who stays, moving when the wind moves, materializing out of the shapeless shore, running parallel, sometimes crossing, no, blessing the path, no matter how close you come, not standing still, not flying away. And I'm gonna close with um, homage or behead um, this was actually written after Seamus Haney, um, who was one of my favorite poets, um, both for his formalism and that's what seemed almost effortless formalism. You didn't even realize that you were reading a sonnet. Um, he did it so deftly. Um, and his attention to nature and to the larger concerns of the world. He was uh, a really wonderful, wonderful poet. This is my homage to him. And um, to our wildlife, which is more in danger than ever. Homage or behead. When I can go no farther and the maps are all blue, I count the birds at the end of the world. Swoop down from their russet watchtowers, long low lines of silhouette stoop to the waves. Piebald buoys bob in the lee of rocks plump bellied gourds with red waders on troll the bricky stone. Arms clasp over pulled up knees, salted by the wet perimeter of light, gathering in the past, shapes stream by, great auk, Labrador duck, and Eskimo curlew, in venerated waves, all plucked, bloodied, and damned. Shingles crack in the tide's ruddy contusions. We have everything to lose and have again and again. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to be part of this reading tonight. And now what you have all been waiting for, the featured poet of the evening. Um, I'd like to welcome my, my friend, Kirk Westfall who um, I've so enjoyed our association over the years, and I'm so pleased to congratulate him and welcome him with his new book tonight, Kirk. Thank you so much, Susan. I always enjoy reading, uh, reading, reading you because you write about nature from within it, uh, like nobody else I know, so it's always such a pleasure. Um, Thank you. I'm going to be reading from my new book uh, tonight, Arts and Sciences. It was published uh, this summer by Das Madres Press. 
I want to thank Robert and Elizabeth Murphy uh, for being just an absolute pleasure to work with in designing the book and editing it and making it an actual thing. Um, the the uh, nonprofit publisher, I really uh, have appreciated their work. I do hope you'll visit the Silver Unicorn and, and pick a, a copy. And I know Susan has her books there as well. Uh, they've got a great website and it's just a fun place to visit in person, uh, whether you live in Stowe or Acton or anywhere else. I will say that the, um, the proceeds that I uh, derive from uh, sales of this book, I'm donating to the group Artist Relief, which is a national group that offers uh, $5,000 grants to artists whose livelihoods have been impacted in one way or another by COVID-19. Uh, I thought that would be a good way to, uh, to express uh, the, the thanks for this, this book. I want to begin, I'll read maybe seven or eight poems. They're all fairly short. Uh, they all kind of revolve in some way around the theme of, of longing. Uh, but I'll begin with, uh, there are two epigraphs in the book. I'll begin just by reading one of them uh, to set the stage a little bit. The most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly. This is religiousness. And that was written by Albert Einstein, who was a writer. The first poem that I'll read is called Resonance, and uh, this has a special place in my engineer's heart because it breaks the rules. Resonance speaks of deriving more energy from a system coming out than what goes in, and that violates all sorts of physical laws, and yet it's around us all the time. Resonance. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Isaac Newton would disavow me. Einstein just might ask my name. Angels and devils both adore me. I shake bridges to the valley with a breeze. I seduce a cello's maple curves. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But a stairwell turns my hum into a swell. You turn my quiver into waves as I unzip the fabric of our known molecular lattice and amplify vibrations in our matter through directives all internal. I whisper and you return a song, energy pulsing from the void at the slightest suggestion. Capture me and you will understand everything. The next poem, I hope, answers a question that Kira asked at the very beginning of this. Uh, and this uh, derived from a conversation I had with a friend where we thought this would be a fun challenge to try to write a poem in a musical key. This is not an easy key, Kira. This is the key of E flat, uh, which has at least three flats on the scale, which makes it very hard to play on just about any instrument. Uh, but it's called A Poem in E flat. I will write this poem in E flat so that when you play it, you will sweat the warm hum of twilight blue surrender, just beneath the flame of Norma Jean, safe from wind. Here, the liquid ebony bubbles to your touch and aches to be pressed and joined into sonorous and supple runes that only you might trace and know. Always a woman to me. Please, before this then resolves into amen, it's A flat, E flat, let it be. Discover them for me, these runes, because I kept you warm and wanting. Susan mentioned sonnets a minute ago. This next poem is a sonnet. I love to write sonnets. I am sometimes slave to rhyme and rhythm, as people who know me will attest. Uh, I owe the title of this poem to Georgia, 
uh, when we uh, met regularly as a poetry group, I brought this poem probably seven or eight years ago. And uh, I said, it's a sonnet. It's about a lot of things. And that's what its working title is right now. And I read it to them and I asked them for some ideas for a title. And Georgia said, keep what you have. So Georgia, I kept the title and this is called A Sonnet About Many Things. A dove lies soft behind this frosted glass. Her water lines entreat me with their grace. I pray to her, she prays to me, alas. I trace her form, it cannot form her face. I mark with supplication all her days. Their shadow dance conceals a sultry touch. The pain is fixed, the glass translucent stays, chastising me for coveting too much. So, silhouette of hope and of desire, my hands unfolded ask to hold your name. But dare I claim the wonder you inspire could fairer be if wonder you remain. In praying, shall I ask this glass to lift or count reluctance in its days, my gift? This poem uh, is dedicated to any of my colleagues who might be listening tonight. I, uh, I don't know if um, any of them are, are here or not, but I hope so. Uh, the, um, the group that I work in at my, uh, my company, we are an environmental consulting firm, uh, is called the One Water Group. And we work on finding ways to drive as much benefit as we can from each drop of water, sometimes recycling it. It means a lot of different things. But this poem is called One Water, and it's a slightly different take on that concept. Oh, how you amble through the night, yet light cannot the self-same soul commit from restless shrill. In darkness but the swell of breath, to death-defiant writhe of all that's been at dawn's distill. Insistent as all days unmet is wet emulsion into salient sleep, in sweet until your anxious days will seethe again. And when at last they sigh in blind repose, I know they will, Reveal at night their lustful ways of days, but reverent be to moonwash in the way it silent stills. I promised all of my friends at work a little hydrology tonight, and there it was. This next one is another somewhat musical poem. Uh, it's not in any specific key, I don't think. It's called Resolution. Come inside the music with me. Watch your step over the bass clef. You will see things in here you never recognized outside. If you climb and cling to the treble bars, you will see that each note is a bird of a different color perched there. Beaks to the wind, emerald descending through ruby into amber in progressions of astonishing precision. Grace note of clever diamond and the pondering base, a bed of violet beneath. Everything is blue, but not blue. In here, your fing the fingers on the keys brush your lips. Your chest becomes the cello holding its tone, and we gasp as an owl rearranges the birds so that they complete each other's phrases, but slowly. Meander through the codas. Find the lost children and lift them into undiscovered clarity. All right, let's see just a few more here. Next one is called Waterstone. I found a stone that felt like a river, in a river cold and gray as stone, and I held them in my hands together. They rolled until I could no longer tell them apart by just their streamlines. I closed my eyes and knew that in my hands, without my eyes receiving light, the two reduced to molecules and that all that distinguished them at this scale was their ache to either tumble or to cling. 
and then perhaps the both at once. And that is when my hands finally understood. This next poem is one that I wrote after several stints of doing some, some water work in the Arabian desert. And I was uh, amazed every time I would visit that country uh, at the expressiveness of women's eyes. Of course, their, their bodies and faces are covered with the burqas and the niqabs, and you can only see their eyes and you're not really supposed to look at them, but it's almost impossible not to. And we're seeing that now, of course, with masks. And I've started to notice again how incredibly expressive people can be with just their eyes. And that's what this poem is about. Arabian eyes. Those who cannot hear teach themselves to see. Those who cannot see learn to touch so gently they can feel the color of an apple with their hands. Those who cannot yet be seen behind a shroud of time gone by learn by need to gather essence in the space allotted in their eyes all desires and charisma, all mystique and lifelong wonder, all the tigress and the fawn. Two more poems, uh, they're both rather short. This, uh, this one here is um, a celebration of sorts uh, taken from an actual experience of mine. Uh, many of you know that several years ago I built a cabin out on a remote ravine in western Massachusetts. And uh, this poem uh, stems from, from the really the blue part of our state meeting the red part of our state. Uh, and I hope that uh, it reminds me at least that there hopefully, and I believe that there is, a lot more than that unites us than, than divides, uh, but you have to look for it. This is called Common Ground. Two men stand on a mountain slope before first light, rain trundling down their canvas shoulders, sipping tepid coffee from styrofoam, the only way it works on days like this. They gaze down into the hearth of this ravine, hear the river rapids far below resounding, Blue blood socialist, Freemason libertarian, shoulder to shoulder, praising the scent of softened earth in this cloister of trees within a shared nation. Another sip. The man in the camo coat reaches into his breast pocket and hands the man in fleece a piece of paper, granting him the right to live upon and love this land as he does, for its rivers, for its trees, and breathing them for its coffee shared in styrofoam when a new day just arrives and all we hear are voices to each other against the backbeat of the river. And I'm going to read the last poem in the book uh, to close this out. This is called Held in Trust. I walked to the edge and asked the river, will you catch me? I heard no reply. So I walked home and lay on my back in the dark and asked the sky, will you catch me? And all I heard was the way it spins up there. I dreamed that cracks turned me brittle and that if the river stopped flowing, even paused, the sky would deflate. I woke and walked back to the edge and told the river not to pause and answer, but just to take my question in its flow and keep breathing into sky. I turned upward and told the sky she was safe and I fell anyway. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you especially to George and Georgia and Susan
Uh, I loved hearing your poems tonight. I love seeing your faces and hearing your voice. And uh, Kira, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, I don't know if you have questions or if uh, anybody else wants to, to say anything, but thank you again, Kira, for, for hosting us and sponsoring us and for, for the wonderful bookstore that you help run. Absolutely. Hi, um, that was really just breathtaking. All of you are extraordinarily talented. Um, I have made it so you're not the spotlight anymore. So I invite all of our panelists, you can turn back on your cameras. Can you hear anybody? Okay, good. Just want to make sure. Um, and so um, I, I, there are just everybody is like, you're amazing. You're the best. And they've been putting them in the, in the chat. But if anybody has any questions for our poets, I hope that you'll throw them into the Q&A. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. I know that we went over the hour, but we knew we were going to go over the hour. Um, so, I, you know, if, if you have any questions um, for our wonderful panelists, please put them in now. Um, but, but otherwise, I hope that you all can see the chat where everybody is singing your praises, your collective praises. I just, it's been wonderful. Um, I, I just, I, I'm very curious as to how this group got together, especially because you, you write on very different topics. There, there was an interweaving, which I thought was really interesting, and yet you come to the world in such different ways. Can somebody just share a little bit of the narrative of of how y'all formed as a group? Well, maybe I can speak to that um, because as Kirk mentioned earlier, it really started back with a um, plein air, which I can, I'll describe in a second, um, a contest that Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Mass held. And I was the poet in residence there. And we decided that we wanted to do something to bring poetry to the museum, contemporary poetry to the museum. And um, there was also an art exhibit that year. So we invited poets to come and write about something at Fruitlands. It could be either some, one of the art pieces of art or something that was permanent on the Fruitlands grounds. And we had a juried um, competition. So I was one of the jurors and um, can't even, I should remember the names of the other jurors. It was more than 10 years ago. But anyway, <laughs> we read them blindly um, and we just selected the, poet, the poems that we thought were the, the most wonderful, that were grounded in place, which was one of the things that we were looking for and that had that resonance that Kirk was speaking about earlier. And um, George and Georgia and Kirk all were selected through that process. And um, and then since then, we've just kind of stayed in touch. Um, I think some of us more than others. I now do a plein air poetry walk at um, Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio, another location, um, which basically means you write them outdoors and you write them from something that is inspired in the landscape um, on a theme. So we sort of, it's like in situ poetry, like in situ art. Um, and Georgia has continued to um, do the Old Frog Pond Farm po poetry and Kirk and I have done some of the readings. It was great to see George today because we haven't had a, as much um, connection because I, I wasn't part of the, there's another poetry group that spun off after the Fruitlands group and I was not part of that. Um, so that was sort of the beginning. Others can add. Yeah, no, that was, it was a wonderful event, uh, Susan, that we had and, and I remember my, my daughter got involved in it at the time. And we read a poem together when she was six years old, I think. Uh, she's turned to other things now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. And, and, and you're right, a number of us did spin off and we gathered once a month either in the city uh, where most of us worked or, or out here uh, more in the forest um, and, uh, and job changes and things. Uh, we, we kept up going for a number of years, but now, as you said, we just sort of stay in touch loosely and, and enjoy the chances that we have to get together like this. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I don't see, uh, oh, wait, you know what? I think I did just see a question pop up. Oh, no, just more comments and, and thanks and praise. Um, and just, you know, you all are wonderful and you clearly have a, a, a really wonderful fan base who really loves your work. So, um, you know, just congratulations. Um, Kirk, 
on your just your wonderful your poetry is beautiful it really really is and all of y'all produced beautiful poetry um and and i'm just so excited about arts and sciences um there are a lot of copies at the bookstore waiting for anybody who is looking to read more um i think we got a beautiful preview of what's in store if you go and pick it up um i do see that charlotte has a question so i'm just going to read it really quick um what do you consider being a success as a poet is it selling lots of poems and books or is it something else? Hi Charlotte, uh, I'll, nice, nice to hear you. Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I'd love to hear what other people think. Um, I've, I, I've been asked this question before. Uh, a good friend asked me how my last poetry book was doing and I said like a poetry book and, <laughs> and, and, and that was the answer. But uh, what I consider success in poetry is being able to uh, write something or read something like we did tonight and have uh, people walk away with a multiple, multiple different interpretations of what it means. It's one of the things I really enjoyed about our poetry group that when we did it, I knew that a poem was, was done when I could read it to five people and get five different reactions about what it meant. Uh, because that tells me that the layering is is there and that the messages that maybe I didn't even think of conveying were somewhere hidden in there as well. Uh, a good poem means something different to different people, sometimes intentionally and sometimes not intentionally. And that's what I think success is, is when you're able to accomplish that. But I'd love to hear some other thoughts on that. Anyone? Anybody else want to take a stab at that? I think um, that it's just when there's some sort of communication that occurs, um, hearing somebody um, listen to your poem or um, and events like these um, go a great way towards um, making poets feel successful, I think. Um, one thing I think there's another, Others may want to chime in on this, but I wanted to read a question that I saw from uh, Kevin, um, who asked, um, has the situation with COVID influenced your work either in content or how you've been able to write? So I put that question out as well. Nice catch. Thanks. You want to take a first shot at that one, George? Wow. Um, well, I mean, you heard my my uh, poem in hard times uh, this um, this evening, and that uh, talks a little bit about the subject matter. Um, I guess an, one question is: Are most poets introverts, and therefore better equipped to handle mm. isolation? I don't know, but that might be worth doing a survey. Anybody uh, else? That's a great great question. I know I'm I'm fairly introverted. Uh, I, I have found that the, the situation right now is making it very difficult for me to write anything. And I think that's because writing poetry is my solitude. That's what I do when I'm alone. And uh, we find, or I'm finding that at least in my day-to-day -day work, uh, I'm spending a lot of time alone with my computer and with all my friends and colleagues on a two-dimensional screen, but the world has become flat. And, and I feel a little bit alone in, in that kind of world. And so there is not, I'm not finding at least the, the place to escape and find solitude uh, that differentiates itself enough from the rest of life uh, to, to really write and be inspired. So I'm finding it hard to write lately, uh, partly because the, the world is, is flat and somewhat monochrome and uh, it's hard to find that time that differentiates itself enough. But that's just my experience. I, I'd like to hear what others are finding. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like it's changed more about the way that I'm able to present poetry than it is in my writing of it. Because um, I, like you say, I do write in solitude, but I do find it difficult sometimes to have that time to write. And um, well, I have the experience of being furloughed <laughs> for a few months. Um, I'm now back back at work pretty much full time, but um, especially you know, starting from mid-April, I had a lot of time to write and I spent a lot of time outdoors, which is where I get my inspiration. And 
I think inviting other people to have that inspiration. It was very interesting this year with the plein air poetry competition, for example, that um, it's not really even a competition, but our event this year at Old Frog Pond Farm, we wondered if, because we weren't gonna be able to have an in-person event, whether people would be less interested in participating. And we found that there was just a real hunger to, to participate, to get out in nature and write from, from that position of being outdoors and um and some people did were able to do it with some social distancing with other people and it was nice to have a place that we could go where we could safely social distance and write um even though the reading that we had in the end ended up also being a zoom <laughs> a zoom event but but still rewarding just like you know this is it is it is, it is a way to connect and we appreciate that yeah, I, I I was disappointed that we had to do a Zoom reading for Old Frog Pond because being there and hearing people read is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I was I appreciate that you got it to happen in some way. That was good. Um, mm -hmm. I find that the COVID-19 time is difficult for me because I'm not an introvert. I like <laughs> being able to go somewhere and bump into somebody and now you're not allowed to bump into anybody. <laughs> Um, and also because as a therapist, my patients are really having a hard time. So I have to work harder when people are feeling worse. And also I find that doing poetry, uh, doing um, therapy over Zoom or FaceTime is really exhausting. Uh, the, the two dimensional, the world is flat, is true. And so it makes it much harder to know what's going on emotionally over in that other room in some other town um, that I'm seeing on a little screen. So um, that kind of wears me out. So I've been writing less, even though I actually have time to write and I am getting out in nature like you, Susan, but um, the writing doesn't really happen. And I love your poems about birds. And every time I write something about a bird, I think of you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank That's you. Sweet. I appreciated your bird poem this evening, as well as the, the ones that where we are imagining another another life and another time, just immersing ourselves in, in someone else's experience. Um, and then Charlotte has one more question, and I, then I think we're going to say goodbye because it's 820. I just can't believe it. <laughs> um, so uh, do you all have editors or people who you run your poems by for feedback? And I, I know that that has to do, I, we, we did talk about the 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 group before, but is there any more process now that the group has has spun off and something new was happening here? I don't have an editor. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I I don't actually have a poetry group. I also write write for children, um, and I do have a children's writing critique group, and I think that critique is important. Um, with poetry, I usually will send something to another poet who I, I, I feel like I have a few, actually largely from graduate school, um, people that I've known for many, many years. It was, I was in a master's program in writing with, um, I will might send it by them. Um, the only editor I had was for several of my poetry books were published by Adoster Press and Gary Mitris is a wonderful editor. And um, in addition to publishing the, the poems, he, um, he didn't always just accept it. And there was one book where I didn't think it was gonna actually make it because he had so much to say. Um, and in the end, I was tremendously grateful. Even at the time I was like, no, you're not gonna publish this book after all. <laughs> but it, it was so much better um, after working with him. Um, so. It's, it's sometimes an individual situation where you, you get that kind of feedback. Yeah. I, I had an editor for this book, uh, Robert Murphy uh, at Das Madres Press, um, who was wonderful and gave me some very good, good constructive feedback. Um, but kind of a funny story with this is this is the third or fourth incarnation of, of this book. And I had sent an earlier version of it to a, a different editor and publisher uh, several, I guess a year ago, maybe two years ago. Um, and the feedback I got from, from this person, uh, was that the, 
poems were wooden and uh, winking too too frequently at the readers. And I thought, huh, that's good feedback. And, and he, he actually provided some a whole letter full of, of thoughtful commentary. And initially, I, I kind of cast it aside. I said, oh, I, I disagree. But the more I thought about it, the more I, I picked it up and, and read it. And he did say uh, that there was no consistent thread from beginning to end. And it would be nice in a book with this kind of theme to have that. And so I thought, oh, that, that, there's something to that. And so I ended up taking his advice, which was just a rejection letter, and completely deconstructing the book. I threw 12 or 15 of the poems out of it. Uh, I rewrote a lot of them. I rewrote a lot of the endings. Uh, I kept the winks in because I think those are important. <laughs> <laughs> tried to make them a little bit less wooden, as he said, and tried to make them continuous. So there are some poems at the beginning of the book that are sort of finished at the end uh, that try to unify in certain ways. So, the, you know, in addition to the feedback I get from friends like you who read poems and, and offer feedback, uh, I thought that one rejection letter was some of the best editing I had ever received. Okay. That's how you know you're a professional when you can take a rejection letter and, and turn it into something positive. Yeah. <laughs> In the big stack of rejection letters that we all have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Once you get past that initial, those initial years of just, uh -huh. oh, I'm being rejected, I'm being rejected. They, have, they don't understand me yet. <laughs> I, I, I can see, why can't they see it? <laughs> but well, it, that's, it's, keep going, sorry. I was just going to say it's, it's humbling uh, yeah. to receive uh, that kind of feedback so directly from somebody you know or somebody you don't. But if you take it the right way, it can be very useful. Exactly. Oh my. That, um, that was fabulous. This was fabulous. It was insightful. It was beautiful. It was calming. It was everything that I needed this evening. I hope that um, everyone in this audience got a little something um, this evening. Y'all are so talented. Um, show us arts and sciences one more time so that way we all know what we're looking for. Brilliant. Yes. Um, please pick up this book. <laughs> um, it is available at the Silver Unicorn. It is available at silverunicorn.com. I mean, silverunicornbooks.com. Um, Kirk, congratulations on thank your brand new collection. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for your readings this evening. Um, before we go, I just want to, I, I want to let this wonderful audience know that I know you're here for poetry, but you should know that we do events for prose authors. Um, we have an upcoming book launch, um, for Soledad Mara, who will be, um, launching her brand new book, Madrid, again, with us on November the 17th at 7 p.m. Um, she will be with her friend, Erin Schulman, um, in conversation, and we love those kind of, um, events, so we hope you'll come for that. Um, and then, but also, you should know if you're parents, um, we do a uh, Wednesday afternoon author series where we connect kid lit authors with the kids who they write for. Um, and we have a really cool one next week. Um, uh, Elizabeth Bunce will be here with Diana Wren and Anna Stanisowski um, about, and they're all mystery books. So Elizabeth has started a new series called the Myrtle Hardcastle series. Um, and the two books are called Premeditated Myrtle and How to Get Away <laughs> with Myrtle. And they are, the, they are as cute as their names. Oh, they are so adorable like please come out for those um and then we have a couple of very special events coming up in december the first is we have gregory mcguire who has a brand new book out called in a wild winter swan um he will be with us on december the 2nd at 7 p.m and i get to interview him for a whole hour and i'm geeking out um <laughs> so i hope that you will join us for that um we also will have, and this is another huge one, if you've not read The Secret Life of Church, Lives of Church Ladies, and A Burning by um, Mega Majumdar, um, you want to read those books, and they will be with us on December the 9th. Um, they are both um, nominees for the National Book Award, and Disha Filial, the author of um, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, has been a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, they will be with us together in conversation on December the 9th, it's a really big deal. You want to mark your calendar for that. And then finally, if there are any sci-fi nerds in the audience, I'm one. Um, we were supposed 
to have a Dune movie this year, but it got punted to 2021 for all the reasons. But um, if you haven't read the book since high school, read it during the month of November and then join us for a panel discussion on the book with three um, Grub Street um, instructors who are specifically um, science fiction and speculative authors. Um, they will be with me to talk about um, Dune itself, just like the book in general, but also what it means for the genre and uh, what it will mean for the genre in the future. There's a lot going on, y'all. It's a great mm -hmm. time to be part of a bookstore community. Um, so come in for the poetry, stay for the sci-fi. Like, <laughs> it'll be great. All right. Um, and no matter what, keep reading, stay safe out there, wear a mask, read a book, tell somebody you love them, um, and then read some poetry, because this was really awesome. Just thank you again and again, everyone. Thank, thank you, Kira. Thank you.